This is the third and final uh, webinar in our PD for All Summer Series, uh, co-sponsored by the Learning Community of Douglas and Sarpy County here in Metro Omaha. Uh, we are really excited here at the Buffett Early Childhood Institute to bring three exciting panelists to you today. I'm Amy Mart. I'm the Director of Professional Learning here at the Buffett Early Childhood Institute at the University of Nebraska. And I'm going to kick us off today uh, to have a really rich and engaging conversation about helping young children cope with strong emotions, which I think we all know is a really timely topic right now. Let me see here, there we go. The learning outcomes that we're gonna focus on today as we're hearing from our three panelists are, are listed here. We wanna think about how we can recognize and respond to the emotions that children might be experiencing in challenging times like these, examine the emotions underlying what we may perceive as misbehavior, uh, and think about strategies to support children's social and emotional development and the ways we respond to their behavior ways to promote equity, inclusion, and anti-racism uh, in our work with young children and families, and understand that the in there's a strong interconnection between uh, adults' emotional well-being and children's emotional well-being. So I, I just want to take a, a moment to give a sort of a personal anecdote that I think connects to some of these learning outcomes and may resonate with, with many of you that might frame our conversation today. So I, um, I, I was reflecting a little bit on an experience I had recently with my own child, who is four years old, falls squarely within the range that we'll be discussing today. Uh, and very recently, my husband and I uh, were going to go out for the evening and had a, a babysitter come to the house. We were going to go out and have a little picnic for our anniversary. And we had someone come to, to care for him, someone he knew and has spent a lot of time with, you know, a trusted adult. And we thought that this would probably be uh, a fairly smooth thing, that something we've done before. Uh, but about an hour before uh, we were getting ready to leave, he started really um, having a hard time. He was refusing to eat his dinner. He was throwing his toys, you know, engaging in behaviors that I haven't seen him engage in in, in a long time. Uh, really, uh, what I, you know, at first I perceived as being misbehaving. Uh, and as the, the time grew near and nearer for us to leave, is escalated to the point that I myself was, was pretty frustrated and escalated uh, and trying to get out the door, frankly. And finally, when I was able to sit down and have a conversation with him, it, I realized, it clicked for me, that he, he had not been away from us since March. We, we have, we, we've had people caring for him, but we have been in the house with him. He had not been physically separated from us since March. Uh, and what a profound... Uh, Sense of, sense of anxiety he was having around that, that he wasn't really able to articulate until I started asking questions. Uh, so the fact that I, you know, I know him and, and, and was able to take the time to connect with him allowed us to uncover the feelings that were under the, the behavior that was happening there. Uh, but also my own anxiety that was, that was escalating over the course of that hour as I was trying to get myself ready and get out the door, I think created this sort of vicious cycle with, with, with the two of us. And that connects to the, this last point in our learning outcomes today. So I, I imagine many of you can, can relate to examples like that that you've seen either in, in your classrooms or your homes or other places over the last several months. And I hope that the, the learning we do together today can really uh, help us think about how to be really, really purposeful and mindful in responding to behavior and helping children cope with, with the feelings that they're experiencing right now. So uh, we're gonna hear today from three really incredible panelists who will bring different perspectives to, to these, uh, these issues. Jaina Haybrock, uh, who's the Director of Prevention Services at the Child Saving Institute here in Omaha. Carrie Anna Skye, who's an Assistant Professor of Early Childhood Education at the University of Nebraska Omaha. And Patricia Jennings, who's a Professor of Education at the University of Virginia. Uh, we'll all be, he we'll be hearing from each of them in turn, and then we'll have plenty of time at the end for questions and answers. One just quick housekeeping thing that I will mention, um, as you exit the webinar, you'll um, be led to a, a brief survey that we'll, where we'll ask you to give some feedback about the webinar. I mentioned this now in case folks need to log off a little early, but we really, really wanna encourage you to do that brief survey just to give us feedback about your learning today and help us to be able to uh, better design future learning experiences that can serve everyone's needs. So please do that. Uh, and I will uh, take, to pass the mic over to Jaina Haybrock to, to share a little bit with us about her work and, and support for young children. Here we go. 
¿no? All right, Gina, we can see your screen, but we cannot yet hear you. All right. Well, welcome. Can you hear me now? Wonderful. Welcome. All right. So uh, welcome, everyone. Thanks, Amy. Um, let's, we're going to jump right in. So um, I want to um, point out this uh, feeling face right here and have everybody take a moment and think about what this little um, little person might be feeling. I'm going to bet that many of you have worked with a child experiencing this emotion. It might be your own child or a child in your classroom, but we've all likely been there. To me, this child reminds me of James, a child in my infant toddler classroom when I was a teacher. James loved to go outside until one day he didn't. And so I began to see this emotion and the behavior around it every time we got ready to go outside. He would lay on the floor and cry and kick and stomp his feet and push his friends. James was about 22 months old and he didn't have all the words to tell me what was going on in his world, but I was persistent and every day I tried to figure it out. I realized the weather had changed, maybe James was cold, but that wasn't it. Then I realized that we had been wearing sandals every day and all of a sudden we started wearing socks and shoes. Aha, I had it. I'd figured it out. But it wasn't really about the wearing of the socks and shoes. It was more about this seam that rubbed on his toes. And I can still remember the sweet delight on little James's face when he figured out what was, when we figured out what was wrong and I knew I could help him. So when I figured this out, we could practice every day. Before we'd go in, we went outside, I could say to James, hey, James, how's your sock? Tell me what's going on. Let me show you how to fix it. And we could practice that. Until a few days later, when I asked him about his sock and he gave me a thumbs up, I knew then that James had the internal resources and the skills to persist through his discomfort. The thing I want you to think about when children have strong emotions is that emotions and the behavior around the emotion has meaning and reason. So like Amy said, she figured it out what was going on for her child and she was able to take a few minutes. So it's our job as the caring adults to help children recognize the emotion and support them through it. But here's the caveat. Sometimes the behavior doesn't always match the emotion. So in this picture, we can tell that this little guy is sad and mad, um, but sometimes we can't always figure that out. In my program, Kid Squad, we get called in to support children with very intense behaviors, and it takes patience and persistence and detective work to figure out what the message is behind the behavior and the emotions. An example of this is when we got called in to help a child who struggled at nap time. When we observed initially, we could tell that this little guy was really dysregulated. His behavior at nap time ranged from aggression to peers to complete disrespect of his teachers. And he would run around the room laughing and knocking things off of shelves. And although the behavior <clears throat> didn't necessarily look like fear, we began to learn that that's what was going on for this child. Our work in relationship with his adoptive parents led us to the history that this child had been physically and sexually abused at nap and bedtime in the bathroom for the first 18 months of his life. The teachers thought they were helping him because he didn't sleep at nap time. So they put his nap mat by the bathroom where the light was on and since he didn't sleep, he could look at books and do puzzles and other things in the light. But the emotion of his underlying behavior or emotion, the fear, triggered his behavior. So we, when we understood this, we could then help the child learn strategies for calming down, for identifying what was going on in his body, and to help give him words for what he was feeling. 
It didn't change the behavior overnight, but with practice and over time, he learned to manage these strong emotions. Like this child, stress impacts response. His fight or flight response took over his brain. We know that all children get angry and sad and frustrated, and they often don't have words to talk about how they're feeling. And in the case of this little guy at nap time, because his, what had happened to him happened before he had language, he continued to be triggered by all of the things, the behaviors and the um, actions of those around him. So instead, sometimes children act out their emotions in very physical and inappropriate behavior or inappropriate ways. And we know that misbehavior is often a cry for help to calm down and a bid for connection. We know that children respond to connection. So as Amy talked about her little, her, her son, how she could, she knew connection and spending a few moments with him helped him to calm down. So we know that external regulation that comes from connection with a caring adult is often needed for young children who are incapable of meeting their own needs. We know this connection helps develop the brain capacity for new and complex situations and helps them develop appropriate responses over time. So I know with James, because we were able to connect every day before we went outside and we could practice those new skills and he could learn new behavior, he was able, able to just tolerate the distress of, of his sock on his shoe or his sock on his toe. Um, and sometimes we're not always sure what the reason is behind the feeling. So sometimes just connection can be the thing that helps to be able to say, I'm not sure what's going on for you right now, but you look really sad. How about if you get a, how about it, would you like a hug or would you like to come and read a story with me? So we know when we can do that genuine and intentional empathy and labeling the feeling and providing some one-on-one -on -one connection with the child, that that's what they need in the moment to handle and tolerate the feeling. So how do we help children identify what's going on with their emotions? An imp important first step is emotional literacy. So many children don't have the vocabulary yet to identify feeling words like being angry or frustrated or have the skills to read facial cues or interpret, interpret body language. And we know that even older children, in fact, sometimes ourselves, we struggle um, when we're overwhelmed by big feelings and we struggle to label and identify what's going on in the moment. That's why kids need lots of opportunities to practice. So we can have things like emotion books and visuals in our classroom. We can label our own emotions throughout the day, saying things like, ah, oh, I'm so frustrated, I forgot my lunch at home again. Let me take some deep breaths and calm down and think of a solution. Saying that out loud and modeling that for kids is really important. We can notice children's emotions throughout the day and label them. We can say things like, hey, Susie, do you see Jenny's big smile? I think she might be happy because you helped her clean up the spilled milk. And we can point out situations in books or movies. We can say things like, do you see the Triceratops? He looked really sad because the T-Rex took his toy. How would you feel if somebody took your toy? We can help label and define feelings for children when they don't have the words. We can say things like, wow, you look really mad. Your face is all scrunched up and you're breathing really deep and hard and your face is getting red. Wow, I think you might be really mad. The next step in helping children cope with strong emotions is helping them develop their skills of regulation. We know when children are overtaxed emotionally, they sometimes misbehave. Their intense emotions and the demands of their situation trump those internal resources that they have. Their expression of a big need, big, a need or a big feeling sometimes looks like aggression or disrespect or cooperative or uncooperative behavior. This is simply proof that children haven't built those self-regulation skills yet. So as I mentioned, children need to practice a lot. 
as we did with the child who struggled at nap time, we taught him to notice his body signals, that his heart was racing, that his breathing got deeper or was much more shallow. And we taught him strategies to do in the moment, like take deep breaths, ask for a break. And he really liked to do wall push-ups when he started to feel tense and, was, and his behavior started to get triggered by his emotions. And I can't say enough about the importance of structure and predictability when things and when things have to change be sure to announce those tell children when the transitions when routines are going to change because of it's raining outside or whatever that might be we know how important it is to offer individualized strategies to assist and help children restore regulation notice routines or transitions that are difficult and offer a strategy some children act out in lineup transition or may need to hold something or hold the teacher's hand as the line leaves the classroom. A child who finds it hard to say goodbye to parents may need something in the morning that helps them feel valued and connected um, to the teacher at the beginning of the day. And of course, all children need to move. We know it's hard for kids to sit still and focus for a long time without activity. So doing things um, to provide um, movement within the classroom. And we know it can be difficult to figure out what a child needs in a given situation, but if we watch and listen, children will often tell us and our commitment to supporting the child to meet his needs in a healthier way may get him on a track for the rest of his life. Early childhood is important. And lastly, my email address, if you would, if you have questions about um, emotions and behavior, um, please feel free to email me. I'm happy to, to help or provide ideas for support. Thank you so much, Jaina. That was just so practical and, you know, I think really gives us a concrete sense of what's, what's involved in, in helping our, our kiddos to recognize and manage their emotions. Thank you so much. Uh, while we're, we're transitioning, uh, I'm, I'll welcome Carianna Skye to take the stage here. We should be able to get her slides up and, and hear from her. She's really going to bring a, a perspective on what, what it means to take an anti-racist approach to this work and, and how you know, adults' responses and adults' um, uh, own, own biases can impact the, the way we respond to children's behavior and their emotions. So Dr. Skye, take it away. Yes, uh, thank you everyone. I'll start by framing my discussion around a particular story or narrative. I'm a storyteller, so I'm going to bring that element into my discussion today. A young black child, a black male child, is with his grandma. She's taken him for ice cream. It's his favorite treat. Suddenly, a police car approaches the child sees the police car, turns to his grandma and says, Grandma, with fear in his eyes, are they coming to get me? What accounts for a young child's fear and reaction, strong reaction to seeing an oncoming police car? Racial trauma. The title of my discussion is Young Children and Racial Trauma, What Teachers Need to Know and Do. I'll start by defining racial trauma, then proceed to give you a short discussion on what it looks like in young children and some more practical strategies to address racial trauma in the classroom. What is racial trauma? My narrative showed you how a child reacts to a particular racial incident. This racial incident, however, should be contextualized within the larger societal dynamics such as anti-Black racism that persists not only in the US, but elsewhere. Indeed, it's a global phenomenon. However, psychologists, many of them, have defined racial trauma as a psychological distress as a result to direct or indirect, that is vicarious exposure to racism. The bulk of research on racial trauma, however, 
has focused on adults. Indeed, there is limited research attention that has been paid on young children's racial trauma, how it manifests, how it can be conceptualized, and how it therefore can be assessed, and what are the pedagogical strategies to address racial trauma. When we're thinking about young children and their emotions, particularly as such pertains to experiences with, with racism, some emotions are more salient than others. In particular, fear, self-rejection, self-hatred or internalized racism, helplessness, and worry. My story showed you fear, illustrated the fear of the child. Research on young children's racial attitudes, however, demonstrate the self-rejection, this internalized uh, self-hatred manifestation of racial trauma. For, exa for example, a young black female child, when she goes to a store and she selects a white doll and does not want to play with a black doll, what does that represent? It's a disassociation with her identity. But the more critical question to ask is, why? Researchers have suggested that contexts such as the schools, as well as society, contribute to racial trauma in young children. What happens in schools that make young children feel as if they don't matter? They don't value, their identity is dehumanized. Well, it parallels the same experiences that occur in society. Similar to adults, observing racism, as well as, as, well as experiencing racism, can elicit trauma symptoms in young children. So for example, if a young child has seen the videos circulating of police brutality, that may, in effect, cause trauma symptoms to emerge. In order to contextualize the teaching strategies that I'm going to explore, what I've done is list the context in which racial trauma occurs, the outcomes, and then I'm going to demonstrate how the outcomes connect to the teaching strategies. So in the US, Anti-Black racism, as I mentioned before, is pervasive. To give you a conceptual definition, anti-Black racism refers to the dehumanizing practices such as police brutality, as well as systemic inequities that create a lived experience that is so subjugating, so oppressive, it impacts the overall psychological health well-being of Blacks in this country. In the classroom, teacher-child interactions, such as the way teachers discipline students, the expectations they have for Black students, the way they interpret a Black child's play, and in particular, a Black boy's play as opposed to a white boy's play, also bespeaks of anti-racism. Child-child interactions, for instance, the way in which a white child might play with a black child. What are, what are you expecting? What, what roles are the, the white child are expecting for a black child to fulfill? And as if we were to take a black feminist approach of that, we can also uh, examine the interactions between black young girls and black white girls. The curriculum, when a black child enters a classroom, is he or she seeing representations, affirmations of his or her identity, or is that classroom space reproducing the same anti-blackness to which this child is exposed on a daily basis, as well as the school environment? And the, as I mentioned before, the expectations of the teacher also signify anti-Black racism, the types of teacher-child interactions. The outcomes from a racial trauma perspective 
include the internalized racism, self-rejection, a child feeling that his or her identity is not valued. And we know that in some cases, the self-rejection and internalized racism can impact and do impact academic outcomes. Because research has shown that when children experience an Afrocentric learning environment, that is an environment that positively, positively affirm their identity, they do succeed. However, as a caveat, I want to mention that racial socialization, that is the messages parents transmit to children as well as teachers, uh, positive messages about racial identity serves as a buffer against such negative outcomes. Indeed, psychologists and other educational scholars refer to socialize, racial socialization as a protective factor against such insidious experiences. The other potential outcomes of anti-Black racism in terms of racial trauma include anxiety as well as anger. We can see this in the police brutality, in the physical violence and harm to Black bodies. One of the outcomes of such experiences is fear. In fact, the renowned scholar Bell Hooks, in one of her many uh, profound writings, describe her childhood experiences in a work that is titled Whiteness as Terror and the fear that she felt in trying to visit her grandmother's house. So fear. And that also is similar to the reaction that I gave you in the, the opening story about a young black male. So in essence, we have the emotions of fear, anxiety, anger, self-rejection, and internalized racism. I'm sure all of us would agree that these are not emotions children should experience at such a young age. Therefore, racial trauma at its core is a gross injustice to young children. What can we do as educators? I have termed this anti-racist early child education, racial trauma-informed teaching. Racial trauma-informed teaching is part of the larger framework of anti-racist early child education because anti-racist early child education is primarily concerned about the well-being of Black children, Indigenous children, Latinx children not only about how we conceptualize early child education, but the well-being of children. First, for teachers, it is absolutely imperative that you recognize the impact of racism, including the psychological impact. Many times we focus on the institutional inequities, but we also need to turn our attention to the psychological impact, that is the race-based stresses, and the trauma involved in experiencing racism. Also, you need to establish a positive relationship with students and create a safe learning environment. Remember, one of the symptoms of racial trauma is fear. How are you going to offset such emotion in your students? Ensure that your classroom materials, your teaching and your curriculum promote positive racial identity development because there's a plethora of research that suggests racial socialization or promoting racial pride is an effective buffer against the effects of racism. And lastly, I cannot emphasize this enough. You need to validate their emotions. Do not dismiss students' feelings validate their emotions. And I think this is just a conjecture on my part. I think that at times teachers are uncomfortable talking about race. And as a result, they dismiss those feelings. Even if you're uncomfortable, please still engage that child or those children in a discussion so they can let you know how they're feeling about witnessing racism, about even witnessing racism that happened to a family member. 
So again, validate those emotions. And even daily check-ins with children about how they're feeling and how they're processing certain events is equally beneficial for this racial trauma informed teaching framework. I wanna leave you with a list of readings on trauma, racial trauma, that's the website there. It's, it's compiled by researcher Dr. Monica Williams. There is an extensive list on re, uh, racial trauma broadly, as well as the assessments and measures on racial trauma. And I'll just conclude with a brief, with a brief statement. I know I don't have much time left, but I just want to again emphasize that as an educator, and in particular an anti-racist educator, make sure that you are addressing the well-being and development of Black children. Thank you so much, Dr. Sky. Really important perspectives uh, always, uh, and certainly in this current moment when, when we have an opportunity to really uh, invest in, in anti-racist practices. Thank you for that and uh, I will I will transition us to our third panelist, uh, Dr. Tish Jennings, who will share with us a little bit today about uh, all of our learning objectives with a real focus on that final one about the connection between adults' emotional well-being and children's emotional well-being. So go ahead, Dr. Jennings. Great, thank you. I'm going to share my screen with you all. Well, thank you, Amy. Thank you for inviting me to be with you all today. And um, it's really a pleasure to be with you virtually. <laughs> uh, and I'm, today I'm going to really emphasize the adult SEL and talk about why it's important. Um, I wanna give you, uh, well, this is the outcome that I'm focusing on to, to understand this interconnection between the adult's emotional well-being and children's emotional well-being. And I wanna give you a little history about my experience in this area. Uh, I was an early childhood professional myself at the beginning of my career. Then I became a teacher educator and I spent about 15 years supervising student teachers and teaching the same students classroom management. And uh, I started noticing uh, how stress interferes with classroom management. And, and it became, I became very interested in why teaching was so stressful and how I might be able to help support teachers to manage the stress so that they could manage uh, the classroom better and have more positive interactions with their students. Because I saw what Amy was describing where it's easy for an adult's distress and the child's distress to, to feed off each other. And I was seeing this happen. So I went back to school and got my doctorate in human development and studied stress and coping. So that's the background for my work. And during this time, when I was first investigating this, I, I wrote this article with Mark Greenberg um, called The Pro-Social Classroom. And we presented this model because at the time, nobody had really looked at what are the social emotional competences that teachers need in order to manage the stress of the classroom. Um, and to do these wonderful things that we know are all important contributors to student social and emotional outcomes in terms of having relationships that are positive, effective classroom management, effective social emotional learning implementation, program implementation, and creating these healthy classroom climates. So why is teaching so stressful? Uh, I like this cartoon because it, it uh, is an exaggeration of what we often feel like sometimes when we're feeling overwhelmed as a teacher. We have to manage a lot going on simultaneously. Um, we have to keep track of what everybody is doing. We have to manage the time and pay attention to what's going on uh, at any given moment, but we also have to manage what we're trying to teach at the same time. So it's a very demanding uh, job. On top of that, we are usually um, confined in a room and we can't just leave. So we have to manage our emotions without any privacy, you know? And so I, I love uh, what Jenna was saying about ex showing our students how we manage our emotions, using being explicit about it um, will help us manage our emotions too, because we can't hide them, they're there. So we might as well teach our students how to do it. So in this sense, the, our behavior as adults is the lesson. <laughs> 
<laughs> so we are the teachers in the sense that we are the curriculum of social emotional development. So we have to walk our talk. And sometimes that's hard under these stressful conditions because the stress response, this automatic reaction when we feel threatened, creates a, a response that was intended to help us survive real physical threats like a lion. <laughs> um, our cortisol rises, our heart rate rises, it gets us ready to fight or flight. But it also interferes with our thinking, it interferes with our planning, and it interferes with our interactions with others. Um, and that the reason is, is because it was intended for helping us deal with a lion, not dealing with interpersonal conflicts or other challenging situations. So we need to find ways to learn to recognize the stress response when it's starting to get, come up and to find strategies for managing that stress so that we can respond to situations thoughtfully and mindfully rather than reacting automatically, which is our natural tendency. So another important aspect to this is our, also our tendency towards a negativity bias. This is also another survival tool. Uh, it help, it, we tend to think about the negative. We focus on negative things. So for example, if I've had a, a, a day that has gone pretty well generally, a lot of good things happen, and at the very end of the day, one student and I had a big conflict. And so I go home and I feel horrible because I had this conflict. And in my mind, my whole day was horrible. But if I stop and think, and look back, I had a lot of really good things happen in that day. And that one negative thing is where I focus my attention. It's, it's a normal human tendency. But when we're aware of it, we can intentionally override that tendency. And we can also teach our students to do that by pointing out times when things are going well, pointing out times when we're having a good time, when we're feeling positive emotions. Another place that I like to address when it comes to the adult SEL is empathy and empathetic distress. Um, we all are very empathetic people, but what we now know from research, especially this research from Tanya Singer, uh, who's a neuroscientist, is that empathy can actually be painful because empathy, when we're experiencing empathy, the part of our brain that is engaged is also the same part of our brain that is engaged when we feel pain. Um, this is because we are empathizing sometimes with the feelings of the other person, which could be very painful. So this can result in empathy-based stress, which is also related to burnout. This is the experience of adverse psychological and or physical reactions to trauma exposure at work, resulting from empathetic engagement following trauma exposure. And it doesn't have to only be trauma exposure. It can be any kind of hardship that we're having to deal with on a regular basis. So there's different ways that people have defined empathy-based stress. They all fit under this umbrella. Sometimes you may have heard of compassion fatigue. You may have heard of secondary traumatic stress. You may have heard of vicarious traumatization. In whatever way you define it, it can interfere with our ability to be present for others because we're either too emotionally exhausted to be responsive um, or uh, we, it, it, just, it can also impair our ability to um, uh, extend ourselves into helping when we're feeling this way because it can, it, it's, it's a way of kind of paralyzing you um, from being able to support others. Uh, one of the wonderful things that my friend Tanya Singer has discovered is that empathy can go two ways. <laughs> empathy can go into empathetic distress, which is what I was just describing, that can be very painful. But it can also go in towards, it can lead into compassion. Compassion is different than empathy because compassion, the added element of, uh, that makes compassion compassion is this desire to help the wish to, re to remove suffering or eliminate suffering or help in some way. And this uh, feeling of compassion or feeling of care for another is actually uh, different in that the part of the brain that is engaged when this is going on is the part that is the reward center of the brain. So feeling compassion is actually a, a very pleasant experience. It feels good to feel compassion. 
So one of the things my friend Tanya Singer has been doing is finding ways to help people shift from empathy into compassion so they don't burn out, so they don't get exhausted. Um, and part of that involves being aware of what's going on inside of you, um, noticing how you're feeling, and also to be able to consciously think a little bit about what the other person needs and how to actually help them, rather than getting too uh, engaged in that distress process. And using some tools and techniques like mindfulness to calm down and self-regulate. And that takes us to uh, building resilience with mindful compassion. And the first step is understanding this context that I was describing and building our resilience through self-care processes. And everybody has to figure out that for themselves, but we really need to care for ourselves. Um, when we get exhausted, that's when we become more emotionally distressed. Um, and building this emotional mastery uh, and understanding our emotions Practicing mindfulness can be very, very helpful. It's like building a muscle that can help you be more aware and responsive to situations that can be challenging. And intentionally cultivating compassion can also be beneficial. One way to do this uh, is to take a nice, long, slow, deep breath. One of the things we know is that when we take a nice, slow breath, it calms down our autonomic nervous system and allows us to settle from one of those stressful moments. So I suggest that when you have those moments that you notice your shoulders climbing up, you're tensing up, take a breath, just take one breath. Another way to do that is to ground yourself, to feel yourself in your body, feel your feet on the ground, maybe put your hands in your lap. Just noticing yourself in your body can also help you calm down. And cultivating compassion is another important thing. As I mentioned, compassion is this, this desire to help another person, to reduce the suffering of another person. I love this uh, quote, between stimulus and response, there is a space. And in that space is our power to choose our response. And in our response lies our growth and freedom. And this, in my mind, is the space, the space that we're talking about is how we shift from this automatic reactivity into this thoughtful, mindful responsiveness. So I um, thank you very much for having me. Uh, if you want to learn more about what I'm talking about, I've published several books about this, Mindfulness for Teachers and the Trauma Sensitive Classroom have a lot of what I'm talking about in here. And um, thank you again for, for having me join you today, Amy. Thank you, Tisha. This was wonderful. I, I think so relevant to the moment that, that we're in right now. Uh, so we, we have about 15 minutes remaining now to do some Q&A. So I really, I want to invite everyone to use the chat function, as many of you have been doing already, uh, to share your thoughts and, and pose some questions to the panelists. What we'll do is keep an eye on that chat so that we can bubble those up and, and pose them to the panel as they come up. And ensure when you're doing that, if you if you see an option that you're you're posing, you're using all panelists and attendees so that we can all I'll see the questions. The PowerPoints will be available. Absolutely. Thanks for that question, Mark. We'll post those on our website. Uh, very, very shortly after the event, all the way, all the, this uh, video recording of this session, along with all the PowerPoints will be included. So that's a great question. Uh, so while we're waiting here for folks to pose their questions, I've, I've got one. Uh, I've, I've got a few, but here, here's, here's one that immediately occurs to me. Uh, so we are here, here in the Omaha metro area in a context where lots of folks are back in school. Uh, and it, for some, that means that they have kids physically present in their classrooms. And for some, that means that they have kids only uh, virtually. And for some, it's a mix of the two. So uh, any counsel that you all would, would give to teachers, um, and, and this is you know, sort of pre-K through early elementary teachers who are in the position of having to try to engage with children uh, over a device, you know, to a te technology-mediated connection, and how, you know, how we can be staying in tune with those emotions, even when we're not physically present with kids. This is really something no one's ever had to do before. So it's a, it's a 
big question. Any insight you all have, I'm sure everyone would value. I think I, my only experience doing this was with my undergraduates last spring, and I'm teaching again this fall. But to me, being able to see people on the screen is really helpful if you if that's possible. And um, one of the things we would do every time would everybody would put on their cameras and we would all wave and say hi. And if if you have everybody on, if you have a group and they're all saying wait, waving and saying hi, the the pictures pop pop around. So you get this feeling of you're like you're in a group, which I think um, is feels great to feel connected to everybody. Not only is for them, but for me, <laughs> it helped a lot. Yeah. Thanks. Any thoughts on that? I'll pose one more and then it looks like we've got some good ones coming in over the chat. So uh, in sort of tying some, some threads between the presentations, it occurred to me that we're, we're in a moment now where more and more educators, more and more people in general, but educators in particular and, and white educators in particular are becoming more aware uh, of racial trauma uh, and the impacts of systemic racism on their, on their children. And I think to Tish's point that can feel overwhelming that that the, the empathy that they're now experiencing for how difficult that must be uh, can easily veer into empathetic distress uh, to, to use your frame. So I wonder both you know from any of the panelists uh, advice for staying in that in, in that compassionate mode for channeling that empathy you know what to do with this what some for some people feels like a new awareness of how profoundly race and racism uh, impact young children. Um, I want to answer your question and then I'm seeing another question um, here from because it's so similar. What is the best approach for educators to combat racial trauma or support students who have experienced racial trauma? And this is by Myrta uh, Bustos Rodriguez uh, while remote learning. So it's a two part question, so I'll answer both simultaneously. First, as I mentioned before, teachers must know or have a deep understanding of what constitutes racism. So not only the individual mechanism of racism, but also systemic racism as well. One of the most effective ways to combat, as, as Ms. Muta pointed out here, racial trauma is to ensure young children that they are safe with you. Mm -hmm. Second, also to offset the, the messages they are receiving about the value of their identity, it is in, it's quite important that teachers also have some counter narratives or positive affirmations about the child's racial identity and even collaborating with parents. So for instance, how do the parents talk about race? What are some racial social, socialization strategies that the parents are using that you can also incorporate? Could be another approach, but at the heart of it, what you want to do is, especially for young children, because there is so much literature that illustrates the early years as this critical period of racial identity development and awareness. So for young children, you really want them to feel secure in who they are in their racial identity. You want to make sure that they know that their identity and their physical characteristics, racial characteristics, characteristics are equally valuable. Mm -hmm. And if I am, as a teacher, I'm realizing that this child has perhaps never experienced that before or has really been profoundly impacted by racism and I'm having, you know, it's, that's emotionally difficult for me as a teacher to cope with. Um, you know, Tish's suggestions about taking this sort of stance of helping and removing barriers and really um, that, that can be challenging to do, I think, with a, an issue like systemic racism. But either of you, any, any counsel for, for teachers that are experiencing these complex emotions themselves right now? Mm -hmm. well, you know, it's interesting that you, you asked that because I was just meeting with some colleagues. We're developing a new um, emphasis in our program on equity um, and diversity and, and uh, one of the things that we were talking about was this this empathetic distress exactly that um 
and how do you how do how do we learn how to cope with that in a way that not only recognizes the inequity on an individual level but also recognizes the structural inequities and racism which um, is even harder for white people to see most of the time because it doesn't happen to us the only thing sometimes if you're a woman you can see it in the gender bias world but otherwise you don't see it that much and so being able to empathize with it and recognize it can sometimes be quite shocking for people because they just didn't see it and then the there's a combination of of the empathy that comes with that and then also the shame that can come with that the combination of both those feelings can be very painful and people will tend to push it away like well I don't want to deal with this and it's not like you intentionally um want to turn it off but that's a natural tendency to when you feel that much distress so being able to shift into the okay this is the reality facing it accepting it and what do I do now about this and and not only in my own personal life but in the system that I'm part of like the system that I play a role in how how do I shift my the system um, and and when you feel empowered that you actually can do something it helps alleviate that empathetic distress because you're actually engaging in compassion you're actually doing something proactive to um, to change your system and your interactions with others thank you um, we're getting we're getting several questions through through the chat so I'm going to elevate some of those one uh, we, we've had uh, people ask about how to talk to children about being biracial and, 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 and that to sort of biracial identity development for young children, how we understand that. Do you have thoughts to share about that, Dr. Sky? Yes, I would suggest that discussions uh, about racial identity with young children, including biracial children, commence at around three years of age, largely because the data, the research data, indicates that around that age, they're already recognizing racial differences. And they may already be assigning meaning to these, to skin color, to hair texture, and so on. And a way to offset any potential negative internalization of racist messages is to talk to children about, you know what? You are, you, whoever is white, which parent is white, which parent is black, and say, and you are a combination of these two different identities, all right? And also to, make sure that the child understands that this identity, there's nothing wrong with it. In fact, this is an identity that is a positive identity. Stress and emphasize that there is nothing wrong with being biracial. Absolutely, and I see a comment. I completely agree. Uh, white kids need to learn about racial identity too, exactly, or else we just continue this negative cycle of thinking of whiteness as universal, okay. as a standard racial identity. Yes, completely agree. I see there's a nice discussion and some back and forth about, you know, perceptions that certain forms of behavior, being louder, being more active, are characteristic of black children, and they should be allowed to behave in that way, or that those those are culturally associated uh, traits. What what are your thoughts about that, Dr. Sky? I think we have to be very careful about not generalizing. Yes, there are some cultural traits that are applicable to different racial groups, but I think what is needed is to learn who this child is as an individual mm -hmm. and not categorize to the point where you're interacting with the child based on some stereotype and so on. Mm -hmm. So basing, basing our interactions and our expectations on the children in front of us and not making exactly exactly it's a very delicate balance i must admit but at the same time you want to do what's in the best interest of the child mm -hmm. thank you i appreciate that i'm looking through the chat here i don't want to miss any other questions it's been, uh, very active which i appreciate i'll pose i'll pose one as we're sort of calling through these um, 
there's a, there's one question about starting a racial equity team at, at one school and questions about you know data that we are very prominent i think all over the country about disproportionality and discipline for black children black boys in particular um guidance from any of you about what um how you've how you've handled the racial disproportionality and discipline data and and taking action around that first i'd like to state that it's commendable that a racial equity team is um, being started to address um, that particular issue. However, I have some questions. <laughs> For instance, who is who is at the head of this team? How did this team develop? What are the goals? What what is the purpose? What what are the measures that are going to be used to be to evaluate the effectiveness of whatever the goals are? And then how are uh, those um, measures or more particularly the data that is going to emerge from the evaluation, how is that data going to be used? And what is the role of the teachers in regards to all of this? So at the bare minimum, I would like to know what was the planning stages like and who was involved? Mm -hmm. Yeah, Gina, when you all are looking at, at Kid Squad and coming into schools and serving students, do you ever have to address issues of, of racial disproportionality or who, you know, who's being identified and who's not? We do. Um, it's a delicate balance when you're providing coaching to teachers, uh, but pointing out some of those those things where uh, maybe teachers are spending more time um, noticing um, black boys behavior versus the behavior that they're seeing for all the children and kind of pointing that out to teachers. So yes, we do um, talk about that and have to address it. Um, I would encourage anyone who's um, thinking about um, equity and suspension rates to go to the National um, Center for Pyramid Model Implementation. They do have some tools on um, thinking about um, and, and collecting data and addressing suspension and equity um, and discipline at schools. So they have some great tools and I can put that website in the chat. Excellent. Thanks a lot, Gina. Well, I'm going to just pose one last question and your responses can be really brief, but in this moment, if you were to make one one recommendation of an action that uh, folks serving young children, this can be birth through, you know, grade three could take to to take care of themselves and take care of children emotionally in this challenging time. What, what would you what do you wish that, that, that educators and leaders were doing. I'll just go first. I would like to see that all leaders not only recognize the impact of systemic inequities, but be committed to implementing long-standing change, whether this may be in the form of ongoing professional development for educators, whether this may be a complete overhaul of the system, or even your own personal growth and development, I would like to see awareness coupled with ongoing action. Thank you. Tish, Jaina? I have two things. Um, I just wanted to recommend the book Waking Up White by Deborah Irving. Um, it, it, it's really helped me understand my white identity issues and, and I think it will be helpful in this conversation. Um, the other one uh, is that the other piece of self-care that I find challenging for most people in the caregiving professions is recognizing that we deserve to take care of ourselves. I think creating that door and saying, yes, it's, not, it's there's a tendency to think, well, I'm supposed to take care of everybody else and I don't have time to take care of me. You have to take care of you. It's gotta be like a high, high, high priority. Um, especially during this time when we're all facing a lot of pressure from so many different directions for, again, you know, our health is, in, is under threat, um, our communities are under threat. So take care of yourself, do what you need to do to take care of yourself. It's really, really important. Thank you. Gina, anything to add? Well, I would just build on that and, you know, it's, you can't, um, you can't fill a child's cup if yours is empty. So that self-care is so important. Um, and it, you know, that reflection of, um, you know, thinking about cultural humility and how, what we bring to the table every day and, and really thinking about 
how that impacts how we um, interact, not only with the children, but with parents and colleagues and um, ensuring that we're modeling um, that behavior for, for everyone, because kids are always watching us. Thank you all so much. Uh, I'll wrap us up. We're one minute over, for which I apologize. Mm -hmm very worthwhile time. Uh, please do the survey as you're exiting and, and stay tuned for lots of upcoming exciting online learning opportunities. We won't be back in person uh, very, very soon, but we are working on a lot of really neat uh, online learning opportunities for you all, hopefully very timely and relevant. And we're just grateful for all the engagement here today. Uh, take care everyone and have a wonderful weekend.